because I want people to sound authentic. You know, one of the things I always ask them is, you know, you know, who thinks they're in control of this conversation? Most people, most people say, oh, the customer is. Well, and I say, well, who's really in control? I'm like, you are. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Well, welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. And uh, today's guest is someone I am eager to continue to learn from. 20 plus years of experience at all levels of the sales organization. He teaches sales reps how to earn the right to ask questions, which questions to ask, and when to ask them. Critical, critical thing for sales right now. A Salesforce top sales influencer for 2023, host of the Surf and Sales podcast. Loved being a guest on that recently and also author of the book owning your job search founder of the harris consulting group the cool the calm and always insightful richard harris dude do i need to do anything i mean you just said everything i do i don't know what i'm gonna say thank you for, for I last day, having man. me man <laughs> so we've talked quite a bit um i i know your background both in not only helping support and advocate for the sales profession, mental health of sales professionals, and overall just success in 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 this profession and, and an ever changing landscape, yeah. especially enterprise sales. What is where do soft skills play in the sales process? How do you rank them? What's important? What's making a difference today? Okay, so the soft skills are the hard skills. I had once had a mentor to teach me that. And I was like, that's really good. Um, the soft skills have been in play since the moment we came out of the womb, right? Like we are selling mommy and daddy from day one, moment one. And it's important to understand that because sales skills are really just human skills. There's no difference. Everybody loves to say, oh, I would never go into sales. I'm like, okay, convince me. And they'll convince me. I'm like, you know, you're selling me on your idea, right? You sure? You sure you don't want to go in sales? So, which is fine, by the way. I don't need everybody should not be in sales. Everybody shouldn't be a doctor. Everybody shouldn't be whatever, right? So, so for me, the key skill has always been listening. I don't think that the skills have changed any different than they were a year ago or two years ago or during the pandemic. The key is listening. Now, the words that we hear differently are, well, we have to be active listeners or empathetic or, you know, things like that. So those are the skills that, that I think matter. The, one, the easiest one, and then I'll shut up and hoping I'm answering the right question. You know, yeah. I stopped teaching how to handle objections. Nobody wants to be handled. We have to marinate in objections. If someone tells you, you know, I'm sorry, we're just not going to do it. The budget got cut. We don't have that. We race because we've been conditioned and taught, well, what about a deal? Or what about this? And it's like, as opposed to Tim, oh, man, you know, I'm hearing that a lot. How's everybody going over there? I mean, people are getting budgets cut. How's, you know, how's your team doing? How's the morale doing? I know you really wanted this. Like, is it affecting you? Like, and, and so you really spend time marinating in that objection and the emotions mm -hmm. based on that objection so that you can create that empathy. That's where you're at. Um, but we've never been really taught that very well. Um, so anyway, so that's the soft skill. So the soft skills have never changed. Believe me, it's an easier and more convenient excuse now to say budget than it was in June of last year or in June of 21 or whatever, right? Like it was easier to say competitor or it's easier to say competitor in pricing because someone's cutting more deals. It's just, it's the same excuse. So we need to stop believing these things. I'm going to go on one more tangent for one more rant for a second. 
Um, this is not my quote. I read it the other day of someone said, if we show up with this constant defeatist attitude, well, that's going to affect every conversation we have in the sales process. That doesn't mean you fake it till you make it. It doesn't mean that you pretend like everything's rosy. It means you have to just acknowledge where you're at, what's actually happening, and then figuring out what's the best way to move forward. It makes it makes sense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take us back. First thing you said that, that really struck with me is it these are hard skills. They're hard skills to learn, they're hard skills to always maintain that. I think self-awareness mm-hmm. and presence as we get caught up in our day and the Zoom calls and the frustrations of your own pressures bearing down on you as a seller. Yeah. But I love the fact that you said, you know, we all have been sellers. We all sell. Everything is, and and I I liken it to, you know, sales people in a business is a channel to sell through. Correct. Would you agree? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and the the strength of that channel, the human to human part, is that we have skin in it together. The trust, the the I've got somebody here that's going to help me get through this kind of. Yeah. That's the position of what makes being a seller so strong. We sometimes miss that when we think of the seller's job, the seller's role is to make phone calls and send emails. Well, part of it is part of it is the personality. I, I was loving what you were saying where, you know, a minute ago you were saying it's hard to do some of these things like listen and stuff. And in reality, it's really hard for extroverts. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, and exciting, ex, not exciting, excited people who it tends to be the standard for salespeople. Yeah, it's why introverts have started to become very good at sales. The quiet people. It's why I think sometimes customer success is better at selling than actual salespeople because they're really good at saying, "Hey, before I answer that, what are you really trying to accomplish?" Yeah. Same with IT people. Like this is it. And then to the part you were talking about, this trust is right. I, the, when I teach active listening, I talk about, we need to get our prospects and customers to fall in trust with us first. Yeah. Not product, not, not love. I don't want them to ever love me. I want them to trust me. They can love the product. Yeah. But I'm not looking for love. I'm looking for trust. Well, and I think it goes back to, when we see the, you know, Ethan Butte talked about this on when he came on, it was we're all programmed to be defensive towards somebody that comes in maybe a little too personal or doesn't seem real and and and, and it kind of seems fake, right? We can kind of turn that off. Like I get the email all the time. Oh, because I was in a fraternity or because I went to this college, we should talk. I'm not looking necessarily for a friend. I'm looking for a commercial relationship with somebody that can solve my problems. So I... So I, I have a couple of beliefs around this. So one, I agree they are annoying. Yep. I'm also a salesperson. I'm more annoyed by the fact that not that they've done lame research, that they sent that message, but that they did no research to realize I had to have one employee me. Yeah. Right. Like the, I'm more annoyed about that. True. I don't, it doesn't, if someone likes, sees that I like surfing from the surfing sales thing, or if they like, see, I went to University of Arizona. I actually don't mind, you know, this whole, like that stuff doesn't matter anymore. I mean, well, that's, you know, who's telling us that salespeople <laughs> don't do. Now, if there's data that supports yeah. the theory, by all means, I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you, I have sent so many connection requests when University of Georgia won. True. Hey, go dogs. I grew up in Macon, Georgia. I'd love to connect with you. People take that stuff, like stop it. But it's not the message there. It's it's the audience of who everybody's complaining. In fact, I should write a post to call out all the gurus. Um, and uh, and then you know whatever lack of effort there is. But if it's a good product, I'll look. That's you know? true. So. But I but and I think to your point there, it's it's the one two punch, right? It's the right. you can use that if you've actually already qualified me and you have a fit for me that you think is truly there's, there's real fit. It's the opposite, which you see some companies do, which is run through the database of everybody that just graduated from that college and send the same message. Yeah. 
That's so, so you're spot on. I think the nuance in that is so true because I think as, as humans, we're programmed to kind of shut that stuff out, to kind right. of protect ourselves. Yep. Yep. And, and, you know, I want to go now a step further into this listening. You brought up last time we were talking a song that I thought I knew very, very well. Right. Sing me a song, Mr. Piano Man. Yeah. Yeah. Take, yeah, yeah. Me, take me through this because as somebody who thought, oh, Billy Joel, I know the song. I got these words. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is an active listening exercise I do uh, when I do active listening training. Yeah. And I ask people, you know, in the group, how many people know the song? You know, Billy Joel, Piano Man. Most people do, not always. Um, I might even play it so they can hear it. If, if the group says I've never heard it. I'll be like, great, okay, well, we're going to play it. And then afterwards, and, you know, this is for those who are listening to think, yeah. you know, there's a lyric. Who at the, you know, he said, blank is a, is a, at the bar is a friend of mine. What's that person's name? Oh, and gets me my drinks for free. Okay. Um, then there's, you know, who was practicing politics? Right. Then there's, um, who was in the Navy? Um, and so you ask people these questions and they're like, oh, I, ooh, ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. Right. There's, yeah. one, there's usually a couple of people who actually know. So I say, hey, everybody, if you actually know these, you know, go for it. But, you know, because I want to sort of see how people struggle through it. Uh -huh. And the reason I do this is because here's a song for a lot of people that you know, that you know by heart. If it comes on, you actually could sing it and you remember all the words. But in this very moment, when you're being tested on it, you can't. Mm -hmm. So imagine walking into a sales conversation. The first time you've never met someone, you know, the first time you've ever met someone, and you're starting to ask questions and you've got to remember all this stuff. What level of attention do you have to provide as, in listening as compared to something that you might already know by heart? The other part of this is that sometimes we know the song so well, we actually think the third verse is the second verse and we could swear on our life. Yeah. Right? And it's not. Where that happens in sales is when the customer starts talking and you've already decided how you're going to respond and you're going to preempt that response. You know, sometimes it's cutting them off, which isn't necessarily rude. Sometimes it's, oh, I think I know what I need to say. So you're already starting to formulate how to say it and you aren't paying attention. Or it's, they're telling you, oftentimes they'll use buzzwords like, hey, you know, Richard, we need help with sales training. And I have two options. I could go, great, you know what? Here's all the sales training I do and I can help with this and I can help with that. If I marinate there though, okay, well, do you want? prospecting training or sales training when you say prospecting do you mean email cold call live pickup yeah. you just keep digging and digging and so this is the exercise of active listening that we have to be careful for so that's why i do it that's the billy joel thing the whole thing so it's you know it, people usually kind of like that one well and, and as a kid who grew up with that music right and i heard right. it all the time from my parents and older sisters playing it and everything else you, you you do you you think to yourself just like someone who's heard, heard a thousand sales calls mm -hmm. oh the, the lyrics are just playing in my head oh they said they need to solve efficiency i'm yeah. already pulling up the slides to tell them how we improve efficiency by this point but then it doesn't land yep, yep. which is it, it's 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 an interesting conundrum i love that idea and i parallel what you're saying about digging to like a really good doctor Right. The symptom mm -hmm. is, oh, my elbow hurts. But if they don't dig and they just say, well, it takes some Advil and ice. Yeah. Although sometimes I do want a doctor who's that arrogant to say, I know. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, so uh, let's, let's be honest. Sales is not brain surgery. So, I, you know, I, I, but uh, but yes, I agree. I, I do agree with you. Bedside manner is. Well, and, and, and being that that curious George type person that goes, oh, well, well tell me why it's hurting. What are the activities you're doing right. during the day? What's causing it? Well, okay, you're doing this. Don't. Now I get it. Yeah. Now I can help you with that. Yeah. It, it takes you to that root cause. I think it's the same reason NASA used to, they came out with that, you know, ask why five times. Right. 
Totally, totally. Just, totally. just don't ask why five times because you might really frustrate a prospect on the phone. Yes, agree. <laughs> Use the other questions. Use the so. other questions, which goes into your your ability to coach people in terms of earning the ability to ask the right questions. I want to focus on that word earning. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? So um, it's taught a lot of different ways, uh, and and you know, let's talk a little bit about the the why. If we go into a sales call, already knowing we're going to ask questions, which, you know, I hope the prospect knows, um, we don't want it to be an interrogation or an interview. Like mm -hmm. we don't want to make them uncomfortable and we want to give them space to ask us questions. So this earning the right to ask questions is really trying to set the parameters around creating a safe space for a conversation. That's really what we're doing for both parties. And so for me, I do, a, I call it a respect contract and, you know, let, let's just role play it, but we're going to go through time, goals, agenda, potential outcomes, um, you know, a uh, uh, social contract and then, you know, a transition statement. So let's just role play it, Tim. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, hey, Tim, it's Richard. How you doing? Hey, Richard. Good. How are you? Great. Hey, I've got this down for 25 minutes. Does that still work for you? Yeah, that should work on my calendar. Great. Any hard stops I should be aware of? Right at the half an hour mark. Okay, great. So what we'll do is maybe we'll just call a timeout with five minutes left and make sure we just sort of can figure out where we are and determine what the next steps look like and, and go from there. Is that okay? I appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. And, you know, just so you know, Tim, I think we're both on this uh, fact finding slash figuring out a mutual frame of reference conversation. You know, I'm sure you have questions for me. I know I've got some questions for you. Um, is there something particular you actually want to cover today? Um, yeah, there's a few topics I might want to touch on. Okay, great. Tim just gave me like more topics. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, great. So yeah, I'll be sure we cover those, Tim. Um, and, you know, Tim, just so you know, look, if at any point you feel like this isn't the right fit, please say so. I promise you're not going to offend me. And likewise, if I discover that I can't help you, I'll be the first to tell you. And, I, and I'll even be able to tell you who you probably should talk to. Um, yeah, I want to do business with people, but I don't need to do bad business with people. Um, is that fair? That's fair. Great. And the last thing I really need to do, Tim, is send you reaching out, checking in, and following up emails that I know you hate getting and that I definitely don't like sending. So thank you. Um, so, so, Tim, you know, aside from what you, you know, put on the, the form that you're having some challenges around blank and blank, what else even got us here? What's making you even want to take the conversation today? You know, I, I keep trying to figure out how to get time. time out. All right, stop. There we go. Yep. So that's the respect contract. We talked about time. We talked about goals of the conversation. We talked about a little in, uh, a little agenda. We talked about that we could both walk away. We talked about that. Um, I don't want to help him because he yeah. knows what happened. Um, and then we transitioned out of that. So that's my version of a respect contract. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. You know, like, okay, Tim or, or Richard, tell me about this or I like that part or whatever. So Yeah, well, I, I love how you position it to mutual fact finding. I think yeah. one of the things that, that and, and I'm just role, role playing, it, but still the impact it had as I'm hearing and feeling myself, right? Because I'm thinking, mm -hmm. okay, self-awareness of how am I feeling about this? It's making me open up and it's making me go, oh, we're both in this discovery together. That's a key point. That That's a huge piece. That's a huge piece of that. They're doing discovery on me too. So yeah. I got to, you know, I got to be open. I, I, I love that because that opens up the door. The fact that you say, hey, th there's a right to move on. Like, like you yep. get that right and you, you, you open it up to somebody rather than the idea of, which I think we've all had, whether it's in a virtual room or in a real office. The door is mm -hmm. closing and the person's like fighting to get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and that that changes the dynamic between you and I on this call tremendously, I would think. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I role play this with people and we do them and, and we have people write their own version because um, I want people to sound authentic. You know, one of the things I always ask them is, you know, you know, who thinks they're in control of this conversation? Most people, most people say, oh, the customer is. Well, and I say, well, who's really in control? I'm like, you are. Yeah. Um, and that's the piece. And, and the critical, where that happens, where that actually occurs is actually at the end 
when I say, hey, what's even got us here? Like, I'm not even trying to dig into the pain. I don't care what they've told me. I want to know what got us here. That's the part that makes them start ask, start talking. And then I can start going deeper onto the other question. And that's, for me, it's the, hey, I've earned the right to ask these questions because yeah. we've said we can each ask each other questions. I We've earned the right that we can hang up on each other, for lack of a better phrase. And then I'm going in politely, professionally with the, so what's even got us here? What's happening in the world, right? Mm-hmm. And that gets them warmed up. So, and and it's super helpful to try. And my, from my experience and how I teach and what the results I've seen and what my clients have seen, that's what they like about it. Yeah, it, it makes sense in terms of getting them to open up as they start to share like anything is you start to have that conversation and you start to unwind and share you you end up sharing even more usually than you, you typically plan on yep and that's where the gold is yep that's that makes a lot of sense yep it's, totally it, agree it, yeah it's, i agree it's, with you agreeing with me tim i i know well because i'm thinking back to naraj i just had on and and he had a great question that he started off in events and i'm looking back on my notes it was like what brought you here and I thought, how great is that? Because it's the same thing that you're really saying in the in a discovery call. Like, what brought you to the occasion? And then yeah. we have a mutual plan of like, okay, now we know why we're here together. Let's talk. Right. Completely. And you feel like you're there for a reason. I, I I love that. Now, I made a post on LinkedIn. I was playing around with a with some messaging and I, I loved your response. So I said three things. I said buyers are busy. And you said, eh, wrong. I said, buyers are logical. Eh, wrong. Yes. I think the last one I said was buyers are human. Now, you couldn't fight me on that one. Correct. <laughs> Yet, give it a few years, we might have AI just making decisions for us. But for right now, hey, buyers are still human. So let's go back to this first one. I, I believe buyers are busy. I believe they have way too many things to do, reports to make, all these things. Now, should their priority be on solving problems? Yes. But busy in the sense of, do I have a lot of time to spend with sales to spend on this decision? Guess what? I don't have a lot of time for them either. That's the, whole point. <laughs> That's the point. Like This is that defeatist attitude. Oh, they're busy. Okay. Well, yeah, of course they're busy. But why are we, what do we care? Like, oh, why? That I That's agree. my problem. So they're not that busy. They might be too busy for you today. Yes. Okay, sure. But they're not that busy. The way you phrased it made it sound like they're really busy and they're important. So don't bother them. That's how I interpreted you. And uh, I, I can understand that interpreting. And, and I mean, that's the difference between just analyzing like the text compared to maybe the, the whole conversation, which is why I wanted to bring it up because I said, okay. No, I, besides that, you, you know me. I love a good, I love a good debate. Uh, uh-huh. so. And and so the other thing on the busy is then then if they're not busy, why why is it that I think Gardner put something out that like 44% of millennials are avoiding sales like the plague or talking to sales? And then Brent Adamson, former Gardner, said when he was leaving, he had some he had the stat, he thought it was like 82% or 72%. I don't want to misquote him on this, would rather go through a fully digital or just go through a, a buying experience without talking to sales? Preference. Well, I, I love these broad strokes that define yes. the entire universe. Um, of course. And respectfully to Gartner, their data is really good. So, you know, I'm always being a little, you know, anti-institutional because that's just more fun for me. Um, and there's a lot of, well, what industries were they talking about? What titles of people were they talking about? What time of year was it, you know, a year ago, that kind of stuff. Um, I do agree with them 100%. Look, I'm old enough to remember the first year in the late 90s when they said, people are going to spend $100 million buying Christmas gifts online. I remember that. Like, it was a big deal. Yeah. People were trusting the credit cards and stuff like that. So there is this absolute approach that people want a frictionless experience and through bad experiences and the connotation of salespeople, we carry a bad rap. There are three people that are often, you know, 
jobs most hated, lawyers, politicians, and salespeople. And it's like, well, I'd rather be a salesperson. You know? <laughs> That's true. I don't have to pay as much money to go to school. Um, most, of the, most of the politicians are lawyers. Yeah. So, um, so my point being is that what I think people want is they want a frictionless system. Now, and I did, look, I haven't seen this report and the data, and I'm not a data scientist, but what if the question were asked, if you had to talk to a salesperson, what things would you like them to help you with? And then if they did those things, would you still prefer a humanless contact? So, so so here's what's fascinating about that. I gotta I gotta share this little note with please. you. Please, maybe they did, and I don't I haven't seen the report. So I, well, I think this this is research that we just finished. So I got to I got to ask some of those questions to over a thousand buyers and sellers, right? So I'm I'm nerding out on this data. I get to do it for part of my job, which is phenomenal because I'm just personally totally interested. The two things that buyers said they wanted from sellers, two things. I want to be heard and understood. Yes. And I want them to listen and know and understand my business, my yes. unique needs. Yeah. Sounds just like a spouse. <laughs> if we go all the way, I'm not kidding. If we yes. go all the way back to where we started our conversation of soft skills today, yep, it's the same thing. So, um, and and it's interesting because look, there are plenty of things where I, I do. I don't look. I don't need to go to the hardware store to buy an extension cord. Sometimes I'll go get it on Amazon. Other times, though, I will actually will go to the hardware store. I happen to be there. I'm nearby. Or yeah. I'm like, you know, I just want to go get, I know the guy. I, I want to get Bill the business. Like, you yeah. know, he's a local guy. Like, so it, it's about what level of friction people want. And believe me, I'm about to buy a new car. I probably will not even talk to a salesperson. Like, the, you know, we didn't used to, you know, to spend 100 grand or 50 grand would be shocking, right? Mm-hmm. without seeing it or touching it you know and now it's nothing now True. it's nothing and the pandemic accelerated this too by the way I'm, I'm curious that data from Gartner yes about not wanting to see or talk to someone pre-pandemic post-pandemic because I also think the pandemic has made life and the and the and commerce easier because we don't have to be in person with everybody people I have gotten am. more comfortable making digital decisions because of the pandemic, which is okay. So yeah. it's not a bad thing. And, and you know, this, by the way, if anyone from Gartner is, is listening, this is not a slight on Gartner. This is like, y'all have the data for us to even have this conversation. And I certainly don't have any data to tell you that, that Gartner's wrong. I'm just telling you my, you know, what's, what's in my head. So well, and then I think you have a good vantage point on it because the other side of this is you, you look at, okay, Great, they bought the they bought the the thing, the widget, the software, whatever. We've all had it got ripped out in a year, it didn't get deployed, it was shelfware, it basically, hey, buyer's remorse. Yeah. And then totally. the fact there is the other thing is I think on the digital channels, we have a lot I love that. Numbers. Like, okay, go buy that. You know, let's talk again in six months. We'll see what happens. Maybe you're right. If you are, yeah. congratulations. You know? So I, I just, I, I go there because to me, it's so fascinating. I, I love what I'm seeing you do on LinkedIn, which is like on Fridays. Hey, give me a call, shoot me a text. Let me know how I can help. And I think building that trust, being open, transparent like that. I mean, it's why PLG, it's why trials, it's why all of these things are working and even more in enterprise because it's solving that confidence issue. It's, it's, it's adding value. So thank you. Really interesting topic to, to hit on. Well, totally. Uh, Richard, I know we've got to wrap soon. Real yeah. quick, before we do, um, wanted to just, A, thank you so much for joining us, but also where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, I'm the Get crazy one. Yeah, my phone number is 415-596-9149, 415-596-9149. Yes, text me first before you call. I'll gladly have a chat. Let me know that you heard us on, on Tim's podcast. Um, you can also check out our podcast, The Serpent Sales uh, podcast, as well as our event. And you can always find me on LinkedIn, Richard Harris. I'm the one who would be enough to put a little TM up there that makes it look like I trademarked my name, which I know legally you can't. 
<laughs> I love it. And also, if you're a marketer or a seller or everything that marketing and selling can't coexist in the same room, you and Matt Hines, correct? Yes. Are doing something. I caught a few episodes. Give a little shout out to, to some of the talks you're giving over there. Not with Matt. I haven't done anything with Matt in a long time. No, I thought I saw something there. Oh, Liam will have to cut this out. <laughs> That's awesome. No, leave it in. Liam, do not cut it out. I know Matt. I love Matt. I would absolutely do something with Matt. Matt, if you're listening, you know that. But no, not doing anything. So. You know what it is? It, it's Brent. It, it was Brent Adams. And so now we need to get the three guys together. Three bald Perfect. heads. Do not cut this podcast. out. It's all about trust. It's all about transparency at the B2B EQ podcast. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we miss half. Okay. But I would love to three see three of the uh, the guys that I definitely listen to on a regular basis all together in the same room. So um, Matt, that would be fun. listening, get Richard on with you and Brent. I think it's it's three bald guys match made in heaven. It adds to the logo. Cool. Very I nice. Do it. Richard, I, I know you've got to go. Thank you yes. again on this Friday. Enjoy. Everybody, please give Richard a call, a text first. And uh, thank <laughs> you so much for another episode of b 3 eq Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.